Pra. What's up my people, my name is Spicy and today I have 5 stories coming out of the subreddit malicious compliance. If you like these videos, remember to subscribe to the channel and leave a fire emoji in the comments because your engagement does help me grow this channel and make better content for you. Congratulations to Risa for the comment of the day. Pra. If you can deliver what is asked, always try and deliver what you can. So, this malicious compliance happened to me, but I guess I deserved it. Or did I? A few years back, I was handling a software project for a large company in Canada. My main job was to communicate with client and lead four new joiners who just landed on site in the country. The guys were really brilliant at their jobs, but mostly liked diplomacy. With English being their second language and this being their first project out of their country, we had some very hilarious misunderstandings between client and them. I would always try to help them understand how to talk to client better, as gently as possible. But then one day, I am already in bad mood with lots of issues and projects. And then I see one of their client talking to one of the new joiners, D. Client, how is everything going? Did we solve the issues? We could not solve any issues and I am not sure we can solve them. After the client left disappointed, I called D and gave a long lecture. Me, I can't believe it's been so long and still you don't know what to tell a client. How can you tell them you can't fix the issues? You have to tell them something positive. But I honestly didn't know when I could deliver the code. Doesn't matter, your attitude is wrong. Remember, even if you can't deliver what is asked, always try and deliver what you can. Make sure you follow it going forward. D walks away grumpy while the others looked on. Later on the day, we are working on a code. I need to transfer it from my laptop. I am asking the team, has anyone got a pen drive? D, I got something for you. I eagerly take what I assume is a pen drive when I realize it is a pen. What's this? Well, you told me if I can't deliver what is asked, I should try and deliver what I can. Since I didn't have a pen drive, I thought you could care for a pen. I look around and everyone is trying so hard not to laugh. I, however, cannot control myself and laugh out sheepishly. As I said, they were good guys. Good cheeky guys. Good job, man. He said to deliver what you can and you followed that advice the same day. Of course, this is not the way he meant, but you did maliciously comply to the order you were given. As I am just a stupid nurse, I will let you handle the respirator, doctor. Little background. This story happened while I was working at a major northern European university hospital. I am an ICU nurse with some years experience in treatment of patients with respiratory and cardiac distress. The ICU I work at specializes in thoracal surgery, everything that's in the chest, and cardiology. They there are big differences in how complicated it is to treat our patients. Since this is a fairly diverse group, some have major respiratory issues such as ARDS while others have fairly easy going, at least respiration wise. Because of that, we are granted much freedom in self adjusting the respirator as the doctors know that we call them if there's anything we can't handle. I like to believe that some of the more experienced nurses are also more savvy than some doctors. Anyway, we have no problems with our key. If a doctor says we can do it a certain way, then we do that. But mostly it is a fairly flat hierarchy with a good cooperative work going. Sometimes we get some young doctors who are doing their specialized training. Most of them are humble, but you have the occasional Mr. Know-it-all. This was the case here. We got a doctor in special training who came from another major hospital in this country. I did not know him as he just had been there for a few days. But I could see that I was scheduled to take a patient in together with him. It was a middle-aged lady after a big heart surgery. Normally, when we get a patient from the surgical ward, the doctors will talk to each other while we handle practical stuff like shifting from transport to a stational respirator, setting surveillance up, etc. While I was shifting the respirator, this doctor jumped over to take the tubes out of my hands and said very harshly, this is my respirator. Everyone looked a little bewild, but well, I just thought that I'll talk to him about that later. Before I could talk to him under four eyes, he came to the nurse's office to announce to everyone that he doesn't know what we're used to here. But nobody is allowed to meddle with his respirators. We are just nurses, he is the doctor. 
Well, you got it, doc. As I said earlier, if a patient is in respiratory distress, we will, of course, always follow protocol and talk to a doctor before changing anything. But with patients who are not, we normally take work off of the doctor's shoulders by adjusting stuff like oxygenation, airflow, and so on ourselves. But since he was very clear, I want to call him every time. Oxygen level in blood samples is a little low? Rather call the doctor. I want him to know that we should raise the oxygen level by 5%. CO2 is a little low? It is the doctor's job to lower the respiration rate by 2. You see where this is going. Of course, we also called him in night shift when he was sleeping because it was calm. This went on for 3 weeks until he came to the nurse's office, looking a little bit defeated, stating that maybe it is okay if we dropped that whole thing and do as we otherwise always did. But we went on for a little longer until he changed the word again, because he had been with us as long as he should. I've got a friend on the ward he works at now. She says he is one of the most nicest doctors she ever met. That's funny, Mr. Doctor knew it all and wanted to do everything himself and then got too much work and lost patience. <laughs> anyway, the health system is a tough place to work at and it is a job where you cannot read your newspaper in peace. But this guy, he looked for trouble and he got double. Hand over the exam or I will take half a point from your mark. I remember of this story that happened in junior high school. Well, the French equivalent. One year, we had a mathematics professor who liked to make rules. Not annoying rules a la grumpy old man, but it was his way of holding the class. When students feel screwed or feel like orders are at advantage, they complain. So I think he was trying to avoid that. Rules and schedule so that it's going fairly smoothly. For example, at the beginning of each class, he will randomly pick a handful of names in the class list and check if those students did the homework. If you were picked and didn't do the homework, you got a punishment. Copying notebook pages, nothing bad, just annoying. And if you didn't do the homework, you could still go up to him before he picked names and admit you didn't do it to dodge the punishment. You suffered no consequences except a disappointed look, but hey, one could not do it every time. And honestly, it took a bit of courage or else you could gamble and try not to be chosen your call great wool this one was very efficient he was a good professor fair and smooth for exams he would give everyone's sheet face down and we had to turn them face up and start writing when everyone had his so that no one were screwed at the end of the hour he would announce that time was up and we had one spare minute if we had not finished while he started to collect those of whom had finished at the end of the minute Everyone, drop their pants. If you don't, I will remove half a point. In France, our grades are most of the time a score over 20, not A to F. One time, he goes to Matthew's desk, who is still writing and says, Matthew, drop your pen or you will lose half a point. I don't care. I finished that question real quick and I earned two points. Matthew says in a heartbeat without looking up. I thought our professor would just insist and take the copy. After all, Matthew knowingly was taking advantage, offering himself more time than older people, and the rule was essentially here to prevent student from attempting to sneakily write anymore. Even though the rule clearly stated the deal, so he stood there, waited 15 seconds Matthew finished writing, while the class laughed, took the sheet and marked minus 0.5 in red. Fair, smooth, well played, Matthew. Prof still said this will not work anymore. This was awesome. Wow. I love that story. This is like a wholesome story, but remix. It is different and ah, oh, I love it. That student was smart. He played by the rules and took the loss of points for the opportunity to gain more points. He was a professor of rules and the student played by them. Even me as a professor, I would have so much respect for that. Still remove the half a point, but be kind of proud of this move that requires balls of steel. I have also heard that subscribing to my channel requires courage and dedication. So if you are one of those people, you've got my respect and I would love to see you subscribe to my channel and that will make me happy. I gave my mom exactly what she deserved. Side note, my family is not very affectionate. Hugs are pretty much a no-no and kisses are reserved for babies. Think flea bag but without the 
weird passive-aggressive stepmom. All of this is relevant for later. So, for winter holidays, we go to my grandma's house. It was around 8 in the morning and my mom and I were in the kitchen. My mom made a big pot for the 10 of us because we all drink coffee except for my youngest sister. My mom poured herself a cup and winced because grandma likes dark rolls. So, mom asked me to give her some sugar, just like that. Give me some sugar. I started going toward the cabinet to grab it when a stroke of genius hit me and I kissed her on the cheek. Remember, my family is not very affectionate. Everybody likes their personal space, including me. It was really awkward for me and she hated it but her reaction made it worth it. My mom held her cheek, absolutely horrified, totally worth it. She started fussing really loudly, she was indignant. My grandma, sisters and aunt came downstairs to see what was the commotion about. But all they saw was my mom holding her cheek and me in absolute hysterics. And then I grabbed the Splenda, because that's what mom wanted anyway and I don't think she could have taken any more malicious compliance. You have to come in in person to sort that out. This happened approximately 10 years ago in Poland. I bought my first new car. It was a black Mitsubishi Lancer Sportback. I was young and I had some extra money. So I thought I can afford to splurge on something new and fancy. It was not a stretch financially, but probably not a smartest decision, but I digress. Since this car became the most valuable thing I owned, I decided to insure it well. One day after singing the papers with insurance agent, EZU for those familiar with Poland, and paying what was due, I decided to upgrade my insurance package to include windshield damage or something similar. No problem, the insurance agent came to my house with some extra paperwork, one more bank transfer later and all was good. Few months passed. I received a letter from the insurance company, from the debt collection department. They claimed that I owed them something around 50 bucks. I jumped to my computer and checked my online banking. Did I mess up the account number? Did I forget? No. Everything seems fine. The next day, I call the support line. After being transferred a few times, a nice lady tells me that I do owe them 300 PLN, which is the 50 bucks, for the insurance. But on my other insurance, there is a 50 bucks overpay. It turns out that the change I made to my insurance by adding the extra coverage was really under a different insurance policy number. Phew! Problem solved. Thank you. Bye. Well, no. A lovely lady tells me that I have to come to their physical location to sort this out. They cannot just transfer money between accounts. The problem is, they are open only Monday to Friday and their opening hours are nearly the same as my working hours. Due to traffic, there is no way to go there quickly. I would have to take a day off work to sort this. Hell no. I said that I understand she cannot do anything for me, so please let me speak to her manager. He's not there, he will call me. A few days pass, I get a call. The manager explains to me that due to internal policies, this and that, they cannot just move that money from one account to another without me coming in the office in person. And no, I cannot send a registered letter either. It has to be in person. Exhausted with all that nonsense. So, someone will come to my house to tell me that in person then? Damn, in silence. Excuse me? You say you cannot just transfer the money between two accounts that both belong to me unless I will come in person. This is fine, but I have a rule that such information can come to me in person only. So when will someone from the insurance company come to my house to tell me that? Uh, we can't do that, sir. I understand that you cannot help me any further. Can I please speak to your manager then? He's not here, but I will ask him to call you. After a few days of radio silence, I called the debt collection department to check on my case. I quickly learned that there is no case anymore. The money got moved. Don't get bullied by insurance company. That's the way to go. Good job, my man. Hey, did you like this malicious compliance video? If you did, check out my playlist right here. I bet you will love it. These videos take me a lot of effort to make, so if you can show me some support by liking the video and subscribing, this will mean the world to me. Also hit the bell button to know when we post a new video and join the notification gang. Thank you again for watching episode 1 of Malicious Compliance. See ya!